Today is May the 8th, 2023, and this is part two of our teach through of Titus. I was hoping to get through Titus this month. I'm not sure. We will see as we continue to go through it, see how much ground we cover, see what it is um, that we're dealing with, and we'll see where we go. Okay, so for those of you who can, who do not see the screen, I'd like you to turn to Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. I want to go through the introduction briefly because there was a lot that jumped out to me um, last week and in the days that followed from this, this brief introduction. There is so much material here. There's so much that's actually said and so much more that's implied that I'd like us to take a look at. So Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness and the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his message and the proclamation that I was entrusted with by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. I want to talk for a few minutes about how this intro impacted me. It is, or what has taken place in my thinking the last few days, is what I'm going to call a perfect storm of the Coram Deo thinking. For those of you who um, weren't with us the last few weeks, last month and a half, we have been spending time trying to understand what it means to live Coram Deo. And what Coram Deo means is in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and to the glory of God. Okay? So what does that mean? How do we practice that? What does that look like in the world? That is something that we have been walking through for weeks now. And it is still something that I think about a lot because I think it's an ever expanding thought process. And last week, as I looked at this, another set of conversations that I've been having with uh, a good friend of mine, a lot of you guys know him, Mark Thompson. Mark and I have been talking about this for a very long time. And what he, the idea of dominion thinking and what dominion is. And it hit me last week that in the first three verses of Titus, Paul states his place, his position, his purpose, and he specifies his assignment. In those three verses, Paul lays out his entire life, and he does it in a very succinct way. And I marveled at that because how many of us can, if asked, lay out our entire life in such a very short few words? He literally lays out his place, his position, his purpose, and he specifies his assignment. Let's look at it again. Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. That is his place and his position. He is a slave of God. He knows his place. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. That is the position that he holds. He says, to build up the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. That's his purpose. Basically in one sentence. He continues saying, in the hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his message in the proclamation that I was entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So this is a man fully aware of himself. And that is extremely important, I think, because so many of us are not aware of ourselves. So many of us are essentially aimless in life because we are not 
aware of our place, of our position, of our purpose. Paul is able to, off the top of his head, lay out his entire life very briefly. Paul's mission statement, as it were, is a very brief one. And as I thought about that, I realized that knowing your place in God is the key to operating in your dominion gifts. Well, what are your dominion gifts? How do, what does that phrase mean? Well, your dominion gifts are the gifting that the Lord gives you to equip you to operate in the area of dominion to which you have been assigned. And we're going to define dominion in a moment. But the gifts that you have been given are the gifts that the Lord gives you to equip you to operate in the area to which he has assigned you to have dominion. And knowing your purpose is the first step in that process. Are we good so far? Does anybody have any questions so far? Go ahead, bro. Oh, you're good, okay. So what do we mean when we speak of dominion? The word dominion in the dictionary has several definitions. The first one is sovereignty or control. Sovereignty is defined as supreme power or authority. We know that God is sovereign. God is the supreme power and authority. God is sovereign. This world, this universe, all that is, is part of his sovereignty, the area in which he is sovereign, the area in which he has dominion. Dominion is sovereignty or control. Dominion is also the territory of a sovereign or a government, right? The 50 states of the United States are the territory over which the United States government is sovereign, the area over which the United States government exercises sovereignty is the United States. The third definition is domination. Now, domination, not in the sense of subjugation, but in the sense of, let's call it extreme success, okay? Let's call for, for our purposes, we're going to refer to domination as extreme success. Okay? Now, the, the first man, Adam, Adam had a place, Adam had a position, and Adam had an assignment. And so do we. Adam was given a place, a position, and an assignment. Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. <clears throat> Excuse me, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them male and female. And so nobody has any question. Despite what's going on in our culture, God created them male and female. Period. End of sentence. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. What is God saying to Adam? What is God saying to them, male and female? Have dominion. He is assigning them position. He's giving them an assignment. He's giving them authority. Jesus understood his position, 
his place and his purpose, even as a child. Jesus understood his position place and purpose even as a child and yes we'll go well of course he did he was god in the flesh yes but he was also a human being 100 percent man 100 percent god the concept is of course referred to as the hypostatic union the god jesus in the flesh was 100 percent human 100 percent god and this 100 percent human 12 year old understood his position, his place, and his purpose. Luke chapter 2, verse 49 and 50. Luke chapter 2, verse 49 and 50. From the King James, it says, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. That's King James. The Christian Standard Bible puts it this way. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. So let's take those two concepts, those two translations, and understand what the point is. Jesus is saying, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I must be involved in my father's interests? So at 12 years old, he already understands that his purpose, his function, his place, his position is to be about, to carry out, to obey, to be in accordance with his father's interests. Okay? Quick side note, here's proof of this. Jesus copied his dad. Jesus copied his dad. Let's go to John chapter 5. Let's go to John chapter 5 and look at verse 19 to verse 21. John chapter 5, verse 19 to verse 21. Then Jesus replied, I assure you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does. He does these things in the same way. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he's doing, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to anyone he wants to. Notice the process, the formula that God uses to create man. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. Genesis 2, 6 and 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God formed, God blew, and man became. It's the same process that Jesus repeated with the church. Jesus formed the group. And literally, if you look at the people that Jesus chose, they were pretty much the dust of the ground as far as Hebrew or Jewish society were concerned, right? Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, all kinds of people who aren't necessarily the best of the best, right? Jesus takes those people, he forms them into a group by saying, follow me. John chapter 20, verse 22, he blew on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then we see in the beginning of book, the book of Acts, and then in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit falls and the church becomes. The Spirit is the breath of life and the church becomes. So Jesus takes the same pattern from the garden and applies it to the church. Form, blow, become. Like he said, I assure you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing.
Any questions or comments before we move on? Okay. Let's go back to Adam for a minute. In the garden, Adam was given dominion over the whole earth. He was told to subdue it over the animals, everything. Adam was given dominion over the whole earth. And even though his scope is a lot larger than ours, we have the same ability, purpose, and responsibility and potential to dominate in our particular fields. We are born with the same potential that Adam had. Now, we might not necessarily get directly from God, do this, do this, do this. So our instructions may not be as clear, but the same potential is there. Can you explain that a little more in depth? Well, here it is. Miles Please. Monroe said, Miles Monroe said okay. the, the wealthiest place on the planet is just down the road. It is the cemetery. Oh. There okay. are buried companies that were never started inventions that were never made, best-selling books that were never written, and masterpieces that were never painted. In the cemetery is buried the greatest treasure of untapped potential. Adam was born, Adam, better yet, Adam was shaped and formed, and Adam was given dominion, Adam was given responsibility, Adam had a whole lot of potential to achieve a whole lot of things. So have we been given. We have the ability to create. We have been given purpose. We've been given responsibility, just as Adam was. And we have the potential to dominate in our particular field, whatever that field happens to be. The place that God has placed you is your field, literally and figuratively. OK? Now, the hard part for us is and this is you know books have been written sermons preached speeches given um courses written millions and billions of dollars spent on this very thing how do i how do i discover my purpose how do i discover what it is i'm supposed to be how do i unlock my potential because people innately understand that there is more to life. And we live in a culture, we live in a, a framework that seeks to very early on identify and place us in a very small restrictive place so as to get us to contribute to a larger thing that we don't necessarily have control over. And this way we become worker ants or worker bees or whatever. And very rarely, if ever, do people rise above that and reach their potential. But it's advantageous for you to be kept in a position where you never really thrive. If you think about the amount of crime that we see on our streets, the, the violence that we see, the frustration, the anger, all of the things that we see, I mean, turn on the news any day of the week, you see all kinds of horrific things that people are doing to one another, especially younger people. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that they are without a clear understanding of their purpose, of their place, of their position, or of their, present, of their potential. That's the issue. And this is why it's so important that as we seek to live out this, this idea of quorum Deo, under the authority of God, to the glory of God, in the presence of God, we seek to figure it out. What exactly is God? What, what has God positioned me for? What has God placed me into? How do I thrive in the place that I have been planted? And this is why, because discovering your dominion gift keeps you from wasting both your energy and your potential. Understanding your purpose 
in fact, brings energy, drive, and determination. Determination brings focus. And focus gives energy and drive more power. I'm going to go through that again. Discover your dominion gift keeps you from wasting both your energy and your potential. This is why it's important to make a study of your children. Watch your children. Look at the things that they thrive at. Look at the things that they struggle with. Ask God for wisdom so that you are able to help guide and, and, and direct them in the areas in which they will thrive and lead to more success. Because it will keep them from wasting both their energy and potential and, and also their time. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about currency. We talked about the fact that your time is currency. We talked yeah. about the, the fact that your energy is currency. Your potential is currency. These are things that you spend during your life, which are far more important than money. I heard a man ask a couple the other day. He said, if I gave you $10 million today, would you take it? And of course they said, yes. He said, now, if I gave you $10 million today with the understanding that tomorrow you were going to die, would you take it? And both of them said no. And he said, what you have to understand now is that you have made a value judgment. You have said that your life is worth more than $10 million, that your time is worth more than $10 million. And oftentimes we don't think about things that way. We are just in the moment in the milieu that we're in and we're not focused, we're not seeking to look above, we're not seeking to raise our heads up and look around. And so the, the thing to seek out is what is it that I'm supposed to be doing, God? What is the area in which I am to use my gifting in the way that will most glorify you? Because finding that place is also the place where you will benefit the most. And I'm not necessarily talking about money here because they're things that are more important than money. Right. So discovering your dominion gift will keep you from wasting both your energy and your potential. Understanding your purpose will give you energy. It will energize you. It will give you determination, <laughs> you drive. Determination brings focus. Because as you're determined to do something, your focus gets pinpointed on that particular thing. Anything that you endeavor to do, right? Think about it in terms of exercise or learning a new skill or anything like that. As you fix in your mind that you're going to do it, as you become determined to do it, your focus on that thing increases. The more focus you have, the more energy and drive, the more power that you have. Because you are set on this thing. And we're gonna talk about that some more. And then I realized that your potential is a lot like water. For the most part, water is neutral, right? Water, when unfocused, is for the most part harmless. But if you take water and you put it under intense pressure and you force it through a very small nozzle, water can cut through diamond. The potential is the same way. When it is focused and energy is applied toward it, your potential can allow you to do great things. And again, I was thinking about all of this just because I read those three verses in Titus 1, how Ty Paul was so able to be concise and to be specific and to be particular about who he was and why he was there. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 to verse 5. Listen to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 to verse 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, 
or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's a statement of purpose and focus. Paul, as they are fond of saying in this modern moment in the culture, Paul understood the assignment. Paul was well educated. Paul could have come and given them great flourishing of the tongue and given them huge flowery speeches, which the Greeks were, were very fond of at this moment. And he said, you know what? I'm not coming to you with that. I didn't come to you with that. I spoke very simply. I came very humbly because your faith should not be in the wisdom of man or my words or anything like that. Your faith has to be in the power of God. That's the only thing that's eternal. When we first started the Repairers Fellowship, one of the things that Tyron said to me was, never take responsibility or credit for people's successes because then you have to take responsibility for their failures let it never be about you it is about what god is able to do through you like like i'm fond of saying if that donkey that jesus rode into jerusalem on thought it was about him he was very mistaken Paul understood that his job was to carry and to set the stage and to display the power of God. It wasn't about him. It was a statement of purpose and focus. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Think about how much suppressing of oneself it takes to be disciplined in that way we all want to be seen we all want to be successful we all want to you know be noticed we all want to be thought well of we all want to show what what you know gifting we have and we all want to be impressive because it's nice to be impressive it's nice to get the adulation of people paul is saying none of that was important because I was focused on the larger goal. And because he was focused on the larger goal, God was able to use him in a way that two millennia later, we are still reading his words and talking about him. I want to take a few minutes to talk about and get your opinions on what we're talking about so far. Because again, this is this is this is rumbling through my head, right? For days now. And I'm trying to to get it out in a coherent way so that I can number one make use and number two make available for other people to make use. So you are um I guess my guinea pigs on a certain level as I kind of walk through this. So of what we have talked about the last 25 minutes, what are you thinking about? What, what is, what's in your head? What's in your heart? Please, anybody, everybody, feel free. Well, I'm still thinking about the dominion gift. I still don't think I discover what mine is, even though at my age. So how do you okay. discover that? Okay, it is not too late. And may I say, I am so happy to hear your voice. My love, I'm so happy to hear your voice. Okay. That, that is, for some people it happens early, for some people it happens later, right? I have, now that, I am, now that I'm in my sexies, right? I'm sexy one, right? I am still saying to God, 
what is it? Because yes, I've seen a lot of things, I've done a lot of things, but is this it? Is there something else? Is there another facet? Is there another place? Is there another level that I'm supposed to be at? What should I be doing, God? And I'm asking that question still. Even, even as I know that, that right now in this very moment, I am operating in my gift as pastor teacher. Yes, I'm doing that. And I'm not saying that there's something else, but I'm leaving myself open to, for God to say, okay, here, do this, right? And we are never fully, I don't think anybody with the exception of Jesus has ever fully harnessed all of their potential or expressed it. But I think that we can continue to to do as Paul talks about pressing forward toward the mark of the high calling, right? Even he, he says, I haven't gotten there yet, right? I haven't attained this place that I see in front of me. But one thing I do know is I keep pressing. I keep pushing toward it. And the way that I think that that begins is by asking God to show you and being open to him showing you in ways that you may not expect. Okay, that that little one whose voice I hear may be the key to unlocking that for you. Come on, people of God, talk, talk, let's go. Just waiting to see if anybody, else, if she, if you answered her question, or if there was a follow up. But um, hearing as you read Titus and how crystal clear it's, it it reads that um, he knows his his purpose, uh, his place, uh, his calling, um, or his position, right, as an apostle. Um, would it? it Without reaching um, too far into it, would you say that there's some level level of university to that statement for all believers? As believers, we are to be followers of, uh, you know, uh, evangelistic and sharing, uh, proclaiming the gospel. Um, like there's some level of, of like, um, how do I phrase this? Where it's universal to all except for the part where he, he knows intimately that he is called to be an apostle, because that, that would be his personal calling or an extension to his calling. So like we're all called to know, uh, to know and make known that piece of him recognizing that his position is to, to, to function as an apostle. That's the part that you shared with the sister that perhaps in her prayer time, in her pursuing God intimately, he will then show her the extension of her salvation or the extension of, of how to carry it out. That's good. I put I put Titus one back on this on the screen. Because yes, he he starts out putting himself in his proper place, right? And maybe that's the first step. Paul, a slave of God. He understood that he was God's slave, his doulos. We all are. Exactly. That's the part and, that's, and that's universal. Yes, that that is. We are all slaves. And because of that, we are subject to the will of God. Now, do we think of ourselves day to day as his slaves? Because to, to think of oneself as a slave means that you understand that you are completely subject to the will of another unequivocally. I've and, heard that word, I'm sorry to interrupt that. I've heard yeah, that word, yeah. I've heard that word as um, in other translations and or in other definitions as a bond servant. Yes, it is a mistranslation. And it is it is a purposeful mistranslation in order to minimize the impact of the word. We have, we've, we've gone through this um, in detail Okay, let me just read this. Reverend Gonzalez said, I pray every day asking God 
to give me greater wisdom to understand what he wants me to do in this year now because I want to fill his call. Amen. Amen. So those are, those are good tips. Know your place and pray every day asking God to give you greater wisdom. That's right. That's right. We we all are slaves. And and that word that King James translated as as bond servant um, was not understood in any way by the the people who wrote these words. They understood that they were literally slaves of God. Um, if we have some time, as a matter of fact, maybe because I have some slides that talk about that, because we we're going to get into that today. So maybe we'll do that in a couple of minutes, Jose. Thank you for asking that question. Um, is this kind of answering your question, Marilyn, or is this someplace else that, that you're going? No, well, I thought of, yeah. But, you know, as I said, that my age, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what is my gift, what, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but as, you know, he said, I pray, and I do, and I do pray about it, you know, but I guess the time is not. I for me to hear, to know what it is it. I don't know. That's, you know, because I pray every day asking for his, you know, his Holy Spirit to be within me, around me, about me, all over, so that, you know, Amen. I can, mm -hmm. you know, when he speaks, I can, you know, you know, whatever, understand what he's trying to tell me when I read his word, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, I still feel like I don't know what is my purpose, what is my gift, you know, I mean, you know, I'm still trying to, I see. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that you don't get frustrated with that. That you continue to to pursue him. Did you say her name was Marilyn? Yes, I did. Do you mind if I just share a thought that came to my head and uh, when she spoke? Uh, hello, Marilyn. Uh, I, I can relate with you in terms of every day asking the Lord what specific uh, gifting one or plural, um, is he requiring of me or gifted me with or deposited in me for me to function in? Um, so the asking part I have down pack, it's, and then the second part of that prayer, I seek, you know, asking you shall receive, seek, and you shall find, I seek it out. I'm in circles with men that I, as iron sharpens, iron men sharpen men, or, you know, Christians getting together that a close intimate circle that I can, ask them, you know, um, hey, when you hear me speak, or when you engage with me, uh, encounter with me, or what do you what do you see from where you stand? Um, and they will sp speak things that they bear witness to. I, I will see I'll look for the confirmation there of two to three witnesses in different times, different scenarios, different settings. So I ask of the Lord, I seek to find from those that are in connection with the Lord and also can see and call out things in my life. And then I knock, I, I start looking up these definitions. I, I see if I if they really are natural instincts that flow from me. Um, that's a way for me that I found to indicate or find um, my purpose or my giftings. Um, that's helped me. I, I share that with you and hope that uh, perhaps it would help you too. Um, yeah. So I just put that on the table. Thank you, bro. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, sir, about this this verse about being a slave to God, where I see that to be universal. And that other part is the, the apostle of Jesus Christ. We're all called to some degree of the giftings, right? The fivefold ministry of some kind, some capacity. Um, if nothing else, if nothing else. I don't know. I don't know about that. Well, because, I was going to say, if because, nothing else, as an evangelist, uh, just because I'm excited about what God has done for me, I just want to talk about him. Mm -hmm. That within itself puts me under the category of an evangelist. Mm -hmm. But but remember, and, and I'm going to it now because I want to put it up on the screen. One of the things that I think sometimes causes people concern is that they are taught that everybody is supposed to have, um, everybody is supposed to have some spiritual gift. 
And and I remember, you know, taking a spiritual gift assessment and all kind of stuff like that. Um, that's not necessarily true. Let's go to Ephesians four. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Okay, I'm just I'm going to put it up because there's a a word there that I think. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter four. Come on, come on, come on. My Bible program is not obeying. Here we go. All right. For those of you who can see the screen, you'll see it in front of you. And for those of you who can't see, we're looking at Ephesians 4, starting at verse 9. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 9. But what does he ascended mean except that he, and this is speaking of Jesus, excuse me, descended to the lower parts of the earth? Verse 10. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. I don't see all. I don't see every person has a gift of these. I see that these are some of the things Correct. that he did. I, I'm in agreement with you on that. Not to mention that. Okay, and, and just because I've heard this, and, and, and I think that it puts a weight on people because they feel like, well, what if I'm not an evangelist? What if I'm not this or that? Well, maybe you're not supposed to be that. And, and I can agree with you in terms of the, full, the five-fold ministry, which is for the selected few, right? Like there are some that he chose to, be, uh, to marry and some that he chose not to marry to do the work. And that has, you have to be selected by God to, to walk in that gift, right? right? Um, but I, I don't want to limit it to, or when I, when I presented my, what I, what I was, my thought, it wasn't to limit it exclusively to this verse where it's very specific about uh, a selective few um, mm -hmm. that he's he's chosen to do a special work, right? And to whom much is given, much is required. So, but every believer has a position, a yes. royal priesthood, yes, a That's servant, right. yes. They're part of it, even if they're the part that extends until they, uh, um, the part where they are for the training of the saints. They're the saints that are going to do the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. Right. So even if I was just a servant who was going to listen to the prophet, to the evangelist, to the teacher, to whomever, it's so that I can learn, so that I can bring it to uh, my, sphere, my sphere of influence, whether at work or at home or on the block that I live on, my mm -hmm. community. Um, we still all, we still all have a calling, all right? Uh, uh, right. Right that a part of a universal calling that, is, that I don't need to look for, right? I don't have to find my, you know, where I fit in the first five. No, I already have another six <laughs> that come with me saying I do, that come with me accepting Christ and that I would hope would flow out of me, not just from a place of obligation, right? Um, I'm compelled, I, 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 but out of a loving, compelling place where I desire to do this, I want, because I love him, because I've experienced it, I want to share it. And there, out of that will come a flow of me doing these things and not looking for the position of it, just looking for the opportunity of it. Right. We are, we are all called to evangelize. We are all called to be able to speak of the hope that lies within us. We are all called to do that. To yeah. serve and, 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 and do the question. work of the ministry. Correct. Yes. Yeah, I mean, then... I, I think, and I'm agreeing with you, I think that we've just kind of told people sometimes that everybody needs to be a head or a right hand. And and the fact is that this is a whole body and some people are called to be a spleen and some people are called to be a fat cell and some people are called, you know, to be a toenail in, in the body, right? Everything has its purpose and function in place. I And, I, and I'm completely with you there. This is Everyone who is in the body should be able to talk about what it means to be in the body, if not necessarily from a lofty place, but on a, you know, like Danny does. Danny literally sits on his stoop and people come by and he talks to them about the Lord. I mean, literally he and his dog sit on the stoop and that's what they do. So it's, it's you know, he's not in a cathedral. 
He's not, you know, in some 20,000 seat auditorium. He's on a stoop in bed stye and, and doing what he's got to do. So you're, you're absolutely right. We all are obligated in that way. We are all called in that way. And I agree. I wouldn't want to spend my life circling uh, these, these five looking to see where I fit like a, a square in a circle um, where I can just be functioning in the other uh, right. well spelled out, well spelled out callings of every believer. Right? right. And as I start doing life, people will recognize my character, my attributes, my giftings, and they will call it out as I, as I ask those that are near and dear to me to, to, to help me find it. Right. And everybody's got, everybody's got, a sphere of influence, everybody's got an arena that you're placed in. And, you know, there are arenas of different sizes and scopes, just like everybody's got a different job in a different industry. And we should never look down on or belittle the place that we find ourselves. I think we're going to be very surprised when we get to heaven and see, you know, and I'm just using this as an example, the dude who cleaned sewers in India, but was able to, and this is not a person I'm pulling from memory, I'm just saying, this, this, you know, a person who cleaned sewers for a living, but that person was able to lead a thousand people to the Lord just by, you know, being in the sewer and talking to other people who talk to other people. We are, we are, we are called to grow wherever we are planted. And I think that's part of the issue here. We, as, Westerners, as Americans, as whatever how else we call ourselves, we are constantly looking for the next thing, but in ways that don't honor God. And I think that's what this whole process has been talking to me about concerning Paul. Paul had education and position and standing that a lot of people didn't have. And he put all of that to the side. As a matter of fact, he says he counts it all as, as waste, right? Because there was the one thing that God called him to, and that was more important than anything else. Even though great personal hardship, great suffering, imprisonment, beating, et cetera, et cetera, and eventually being martyred. But the thing that he was called to was more important than any accomplishment that he had gotten in his life up to that point. And I think that's that's what I'm looking at. Like, what is it, God? What is it? What is it? Um, since you, anybody else? And we're gonna talk about slavery for a few minutes. Anybody else? Yeah, but I wanna add something. Okay, as the brother just said, right? You know, that's a question and you know, I've been, the, that that passage has always bothered me, you know. But then, as I study his word more, and I talk to other people, now they said, I asked, "What do you think?" You know, I asked in my gift. But I was told that singing, but really, I don't feel like I I sing that well. So you know, it's still, uh, 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 I don't know what the word to say for me because they say that's my gift. Mm -hmm. I sing here, yeah, but I still don't feel like, because number one, I wasn't trained to sing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, you know, I don't know. So I, I still feel like I'm not giving, I don't know if I'm not giving, giving is the right word, you know. I, I, I If they say that's my gift, I, I want to give it my all. Mm -hmm. But I still don't feel like I'm that good to sing, you know, I, I, I don't know how to put it. No, you, you're, you know, I, you're I, putting I, it. You're putting it. Go ahead. You know, so I said, well, okay, if you say that, my gift, you know, I, I, I want to sing for you, God. I want to, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think maybe there's something that I don't know. I mean, okay. I love to help people. But, well, you know, see, I, 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 that's what I was getting to. That's what I was hoping you would say. Let, let's be clear. Church people, when you talk to church people about gifting, church people automatically start thinking about church stuff. And this is not a bad thing. I just want to make sure that we, we put things in their proper perspectives here, right? When, when we ask people in our environment, 
what is my gift? And somebody says something like singing or whatever. Remember that we tend to gauge people's importance in the church by whatever they're able to do in the church and as it applies to church things. Okay, Rem remember that. So there is a set of gifts. Let's 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 qualify this. There is gifting. There are things that we exercise in the church, and then there are things that we exercise the other twenty-one hours of that day, and then all the other days of the week. And what you just said is like you like helping people. That is something that energizes you, right? That is something that you feel good about when you're in the midst of, right? Is that something that, that you're passionate about? Yeah, I, I love to help, but then, you know, I tell myself, well, I don't have the wherewithal to, to do what I would love to do. So mm -hmm. then, you know, sometimes you just don't do anything because you want to, to help, you want to, but, you know, you can't, or you, you don't have, I don't know. And there are times I find, like, as with Moses, I say, and Moses, we you know, like you said, he had a speech impairment. So I feel like I have a speech impairment. And I feel like I'm not bold enough. I don't have that courage or that boldness to go out and talk to people. I would love to tell people, some, I don't know how awesome Jesus is. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't feel like I can do it. I don't feel like I have that. You know, I, one of the person I admire is um, that guy's daughter, um, Priscilla Shire, I think her name. Mm -hmm. Tony Evans' daughter, yes. Shire. Yeah, I admire her. I said, oh, can I speak like her? Can I talk to people? You know, so I, I try daily to read his word, but, you know, it's like I can't retain, you know, everything I read, and I have to read a hundred times before I'm able to retain, retain something. I can't mem memorize scripture verses because something, I guess, some, maybe I just tell myself my brain's too old. I don't know. But, you okay. know, sometimes when I look at, you know, I try to say to God, I, I would like to be like her, you know, imitate mm -hmm. her. Okay. But then, so I know I can't bring myself to talk to people about Jesus the way how I would, you know. I mean, they say, they say talk to him, them about your experience. And I know how he's been to me. But still, I find like, I don't know. I still can't get myself to. So your audience is not Priscilla Shira's audience. You may, and there, it is not wrong to aspire to something, but think about what you're saying. You're saying a whole lot of, I can't, and I can't, and I can't. Jesus talked about two men. One man was a Pharisee, and he was right up on the altar, and he was praying to God, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these other people. You know, I thank you, Lord, that, you know, I'm just so wonderful. And then there was another man who stood far off from the altar and beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus asked the question, which person do you think was justified? And it was the person who was beating his breast from far away. Because his knowledge of God, his understanding of God and his understanding of himself was such that he needed God's mercy, and he asked God to be merciful, whereas the other person went in a lot of arrogance and confidence yeah. in himself. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because you said two things. The first is that you love to help people. The second is that you aspire to, to speak better, okay? The third was now the third thing that you you aspire to retain scripture. What did God do with Moses when Moses was sent before God? Before when Moses was sent before Pharaoh. What God yeah, said to him was, was what God said to him was, what's in your hand? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now that was important because Moses was in the midst of looking at the enormity of the situation that he faced and was completely aware of his own inadequacy and was using that to make excuses. And what God was saying to him was that the thing that's in your hand, the thing that I've equipped you with, because what's in your hand is what belongs to you. It is what you have in the moment. 
he says to him, what's in your hand? And Moses answers, it's a staff, right? Now, what happened when he went before Pharaoh was, his staff, when he threw it on the ground, we all know the story, his staff became a snake, and the, the magicians of the Pharaoh also were able to turn their staffs into snakes. But Moses' snake was bigger and swallowed all the others. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Remember that the serpent was the symbol of royalty in that culture. So for God to send Moses with a serpent was a symbol to them that there was royalty that surpassed them that Moses was walking with. Okay? The second thing that God did was equip Moses with a spokesman for when he had to speak to the people, his brother Aaron. Because Moses was unsure of his speech. So when he had to give the big speeches or whatever, Aaron was usually the spokesperson, but Moses was the idea man because Moses was hearing directly from God. What I'm saying to you, my sister, is this. What God has given you that you have in your hand right now is adequate for the task that is directly in front of you. And so since you like to help people, help people. It doesn't necessarily have to be money. And in the process of you helping people, he's going to give you opportunities to talk to them about the reason that you love helping people. He's going to do it. He's going to give you opportunity to allow him to be glorified in you. That's what he does. And we think we're, it's starting small, but every life that we impact is a life that we impact. You got somebody crawling around your house right now who's just learning how to walk. Think about the impact that you're going to have on her life by living a godly life in front of her. You understand what I'm saying? There, there is no, there is no opportunity that's too small. Every opportunity is an opportunity to impact a life for God, no matter how small it is, no matter how small the action is. You love helping people. You feel like your gift is a ministry of helps. Help people. Ask God to show you opportunities to help people and watch them do it. He is true to his word. There is, there is nothing too small. There is nothing that escapes his gaze. Like he told, Jesus told them, if, if he clothes the grass of the field, mm. which is gathered up one day and burned the next day, mm. something that, that is that small and insignificant, God knows and cares enough about that he sees to its needs. How much more important are you? I want to help people, Lord. I feel like this is what you've called me to do. Helping people gives me energy. Helping people gives me focus. Helping people excites me. Helping people gives me a feeling of fulfillment. Put me in the position to help people. How about you pray that and see what he does? Okay. Reverend Gonzalez says, the Holy Spirit of God is living in all of his children and has blessed and called each of us to be a witness for God in this work. We are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4. Jose, we're going to have to deal with slavery next week, bro. I knew this was going to take more than one week. <laughs> so we have to deal with next week. We're going to have to deal with slavery next week. Um, Not a problem. Okay. Um, it, is, it is not easy to walk through life and be aware of everything and every circumstance, especially when we're in jobs and situations that are high stress. Um, we've got family issues that we're dealing with. We've got, you know, all kinds of things, whether, you know, it's 
illness in the family, all, all kinds of things that we have to deal with. It's not easy. It is not easy. It is a question of, and again, like I said, this has been kind of burning through my head for weeks. And so I'm trying to talk it out in the midst of people that I trust so that I can get, you know, feedback and also share here. The pursuit of God inquires, requires a discipline that it is often hard for us to, to accomplish because of everything that we've got going on. And that doesn't, and yes, that is true, but it is still a worthy pursuit. And I'm pointing to Paul as an example, as, you know, and I'm going to use his own words. I'm not saying that I have obtained, right? But one thing that I'm doing is that I am pressing. I am, I am asking God. I, I do not want Okay, when you look at a diamond, what makes a diamond beautiful for us is the fact that it has been cut, it has been polished, right? And the thing that makes a diamond sparkle are the facets. What is a facet? The facet is the angle that they have polished or cut this diamond so that it's got several different angles so that the light can refract through it in different ways. That's what makes a diamond sparkle. We are all diamonds that God is polishing. And the problem is that too often we spend our energy focusing on the biggest facet, which for most diamonds is that flat surface that you, that's on the top of the diamond. We spend a lot of time working on that facet and less time working on the other things. And I encourage you, just as I'm encouraging myself, to think about the areas of your life that you know you could do a little better at. Um, one of the things for me is intentional reading. I have to do better at that because I'm looking at words all day long it's, you know, I'm doing a lot of passive reading, but I'm not doing nearly as much intentional reading as I used to. That's an area that I got to work on, right? Um, making sure that I continue to exercise and work out regularly. That's another area that I have to work on. We all have them. Part of the reason that we do this is because we want to be as useful to the master as we can be no matter what position or situation or strata we find ourselves in in life, no matter what our age is. That, that's the thing. And that's what I want to encourage us all to do this week. Think about the areas of the diamond that need polishing. The things that we want, we feel like God has gifted us to do if you feel that you are gifted to be a drug dealer, that's probably not God, just saying. But the things that you're excited about, the things that, you know, if I could, I would. And maybe that's an assignment for next week. Think about and maybe write down some things that you would like to do if you could do them. What things are you passionate about? What things that you, are you excited about? What things, you know, with no, you know, totally unencumbered by the, the current situation you find yourself in? If you could do it, what would you do? Because maybe this is an opportunity to start looking at incrementally how you can get those things done. Okay, we are we are never too old to run out of potential. Okay, as long as you're breathing, you got work to do. Amen. 
It is 8.58. I thank you all for hanging with me and for, for helping me shake some of these random thoughts out of my head. Next week, we're going to deal with the rest of this deal with slavery, touch on Titus chapter two in some detail. Um, but seriously, think about what you could do. If you could, what would you do? And please know that you can email me, text me at any point with questions that you have. Reverend Gonzalez just said, my dear sister, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. And may the Lord lift up his countenance you and give you peace, number 624. So again, text me any point, email me, questions, comments, upset, whatever that you're thinking about, because it's good for us to discuss, it's good for us to reason together, it's good for us to, to just spend time considering things together. It, it always is. It always glorifies God and edifies us, okay? Amen. Yeah.